Please join me in prayer. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Today's Hebrew Bible lesson is from Jeremiah, chapter 32, verses 36 through 40. And if you would like to follow along, it's in the Old Testament on page 737 of your pew Bible. Now therefore thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say, it is being given into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. See, I am going to gather them from all the lands to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place, and I will settle them in safety. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me for all time, for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them, never to draw back from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they may not turn from me. The word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and I'm going to do one of your favorite things and add a few verses. So we're uh, going to do chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, and then what I have printed in the bulletin, chapter 4, verses 7 to 15. Listen to the words that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, including all the saints throughout Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So, death is at work in us, but life in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Our second reading from the New Testament is Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 11. You'll recall previously that we were following the journey of Paul, and he had to flee Thessalonica. He went to Athens, and now he finds himself in Corinth. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him in protest, he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent, 
From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. And his house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord together with all his household. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized. One night the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to harm you. For there are many in this city who are my people. He stayed there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Fill this place with your wisdom and life this day. Amen. Today's sermon is entitled Treasure in Tents and Clay Jars. So remember, Paul and his companions had to be spirited away under the cover of night out of Thessalonica, where it felt like the whole world was ending because of the persecution they were undergoing. They snuck off to Berea, but then some irate Thessalonians followed them even there. Seeing that Paul was the one that they were really after, the faithful in Berea sent him off on his own, and kept Silas and Timothy around to tend to the flock. And so, for the first time in a long time, Paul had to go it alone. He made his way to Athens, that ancient capital of Greece, where he spent time among true Gentiles, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers whose works I had to struggle through in my ancient Greek language courses in undergrad, spending hours to translate just a few words, not even sentences, forget actually trying to understand the logic of their arguments. But Paul didn't shy away. Left to his own devices, he went toe-to-toe with the philosophers in public debate, making the case for Jesus and the resurrection. I am sure that at this point, he was at the height of intellectual stimulation in Athens. While there, he ended up having one of those moments of being struck by pure brilliance, when he used the Greek's shrine to the unknown God as an opening. While there, he asked, why can't it be that this unknown God is actually the God of whom I speak? Why can't this be the God of love, the God of life, the God of resurrection? Yes, Paul was at his best and brightest in Athens among those Gentile philosophers who were so very different from him. And so he was walking on cloud nine with his intellectual high when he entered the coastal city of Corinth in south central Greece. And immediately he understood that he had to change his tactics. The first people Paul encountered in Corinth were the couple Aquila and Priscilla, Italian Jews who had just been displaced from their home in Rome by the Emperor Claudius's edict that all Jews must be expelled from the imperial capital. Anti-Semitism is one of the most ancient evils of this world, and Aquila and Priscilla were lost and hurting because of it. Paul's intellectual arguments from Athens, no matter how brilliant, would not bring comfort or solace to this couple. And this certainly wasn't the time to seek conversion through arguments about Jesus as Messiah. In order to meet these new friends where they were at, in the midst of their suffering and confusion, 
Paul had to come down out of that intellectual cloud back to earth. He had to become the salt of the earth. And so he picked up the canvas and the wooden stakes and the hammer of his old profession and labored alongside of the Jews, Aquila and Priscilla, in making tents. And it was intense. Let's hit pause for a moment and recall something important. Ever since his conversion on the road to Damascus, Paul had had a difficult relationship with his own people. Once a Pharisee, he now found himself regularly having heated conversations with the Jews of the cities he was visiting. He chose to go to their synagogues and shake things up. And as we have seen over and over and over, he was either imprisoned or chased away because of it. It was almost as though in becoming the champion of the Gentiles, he had chosen to make his fellow Jews his enemies. It is so often the case for so many of us that we reserve our harshest words for those from whom we come. So he spoke of them as murderers and schemers. And listen, if I were a synagogue leader at that time, I don't think I would have wanted Paul around either. But for a few days in Corinth, Paul found himself working side by side with this Jewish couple forming relationship through the labor of his hands and the sweat of his brow. For these few days, all of Paul's bitterness and resentment melted away. His arguments and debates quieted, his anger subsided. He would, of course, go on to have more arguments in the synagogues, even in that same city, even a few lines later in our same text. But I am convinced that from that point forward, he was arguing from a different mindset. I am convinced that he realized that his beef was not with the Jewish people per se, or even with the Jewish religion. His beef was with the Jewish leaders who sought power by partnering with the empire exactly the type of person he himself had been prior to his conversion. And I think that's why he gets his hackles so raised. We see in the text that he gets mad in Corinth and dusts the dirt off of his clothing. Some might say getting the dirt off his shoulders. And to me, that's an indication that he was dirty from doing his tent-making work. So he was out with Aquila and Priscilla, and because they were doing this labor, he had dust and dirt all over him. So he had those beautiful moments, and then he would go to the synagogue and see the people who were acting exactly as he used to act before his conversion by partnering with the Roman Empire, and he would dust the dirt off of himself because he was so frustrated. So his beef had nothing to do with Judaism, and with Jewishness at all. It was those select but powerful few who would use their positions to exclude and persecute as agents of the empire. Aquila and Priscilla were certainly not among that group. They themselves had been persecuted in Rome just as the followers of the way of Jesus of Nazareth had been persecuted. And so having found common ground through shared labor, Paul stayed for a full year and a half in the city to which Aquila and Priscilla had been transplanted, forming further partnerships through hard work. And even though he would go and debate and argue, he would form community and there would be whole households who would join him. Friends, 
Paul's old fight with the Jews, before his thinking was recalibrated, reminds me so much of the fights that dominate our society and the world at large today. Here and across the globe, people are divided with a bitterness and hatred that is mind-boggling. Race-based nationalisms are becoming re-entrenched at an alarming rate in this country and throughout Europe. Violence based on religion is flaring. Loyalty to political parties is surpassing loyalty to communities. Division and hatred control our airwaves and fill up our walls and news feeds and prevail on debate stages and at political rallies. This division and hatred spills into our holiday dinners. It breaks up families and communities. It incites interpersonal violence. It causes full-blown wars. I stand before you today convinced that all of this division and hatred does not actually originate in our differences of race or religion or political party. Nor is it rooted in our differences of belief or opinion. It's something much deeper. It's something existential. It is our need to be relevant, our need to have some sense of superiority, our need to win the argument no matter what the cost in human lives and human thriving, no matter what the cost for our own basic humanity. It is the need to see in others the bad things we ourselves have done, just like Paul, the Pharisee who became converted on the road to Damascus, Saul and the synagogue leaders. And somehow this need overpowers our decency, our kindness, and our love. There, there was another attack on a synagogue this past week during the observance of Yom Kippur, the holiest day of all for Jews. It happened in Germany, of all places. How many times have I stood up here and mourned lives lost in synagogues and mosques and gurdwaras and churches? How many times have I stood up here and grieved for communities of fellow children of God who have hardened their hearts to immigrants and refugees? How many times have I prayed for peoples whose lives have been ripped apart by warfare based on ethnic identity? Paul understood this madness because Paul lived it. It was the reason he went berserk on the followers of the way of Jesus of Nazareth prior to his conversion. It was the reason that he went into those synagogues so hot-headed after his conversion. But then he discovered something that could change everything when he started making tents with Aquila and Priscilla. In working together with a shared purpose for the good of all to create shade in the heat and shelter in the cold, their differences no longer divided them. Together, in those tents, they found the treasure of the truth that above all else, they shared their humanity and they shared their creator. And so they became friends. They became family. And from that point, they could disagree and argue as much as they wanted, but they wouldn't do so with hatred and violence. They would do so in a genuine quest for the truth. Imagine what would happen if CBP and ICE officers and politicians went down to Guatemala and joined indigenous communities in harvesting mashan leaves to wrap 
tamales. Imagine what would happen if Israelis invited Palestinians to pick olives and press the oil together. Imagine what would happen if Republicans and Democrats cooked meals for the homeless while they made anti-poverty policies. Imagine what would happen if Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and Sikhs helped each other to build their places of worship and then maybe even worshiped together. It is very difficult to hate somebody who has helped you chop vegetables or hold up a beam or harvest a crop. It is very difficult to hate somebody who has shared a glass of water with you during a break. It is very difficult to hate somebody whose eyes you have looked into while working with shared purpose. When Paul wrote his letters to the Corinthians, he was writing to the community of Aquila and Priscilla. He wrote of the treasure they found together when they were getting their hands dirty with sweat and dust in constructing those tents. Hmm. Dust and sweat. If there's enough liquid sweat mixed with the fine powder of the dust, it becomes mud. And if it's just the right kind of mud, it can be used as clay to mold something. Just as we once were dust, just as we were molded into our being by a God who gave us the water of life, and who labored for us in love. Paul wrote, we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. That treasure was in shared labor. That treasure was in working together. That treasure was in getting their hands sweaty and their faces dirty. That treasure was in making something for the good of all and therefore in building community. That treasure was in a God who would become one of us and labor alongside of us. Treasure in tents. Treasure in clay jars. Amen.